Father, it is with joy and gladness that we gather here together. And this evening we will continue in our verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of James, and we hope to see you this evening as well. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be yourselves also in behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. As I looked at this text, I thought, yes, indeed, this is a text of expectation. Expectation can be another word for hope. And what we do know, we can debilitate people quickly. If we deprive them of love, and if we deprive them of hope. For sometimes, knowing that one is loved will generate hope. But on other occasions, hope that is denied, certifiably so, will kill love. And our lives as Christians lives in the realm of expectation. You can think of different scenarios in your life. And doesn't expectation oftentimes generate a tremendous amount of joy? I should think that for most of us, if there was never any kind of expectation at all, it certainly came in December. And December 5th was my mom's birthday, and I could hardly wait to get it out of the way so we could get on with Christmas. I really love my mom, right? <laughs> but the expectation sometimes could only be topped by the realization. And that's at least a part of the subtext here. One time when dad was traveling on the road, he called up and said, I'm caught in a blizzard in Kansas. I'm not going to get home, at least for another day. Mom was worried, but I was just thinking, good, dad will be home. But however he did it, he drove through the storm and he came into the house at about one in the morning and we all woke up and we were glad. And the only thing that was greater than the expectation is the realization of it all. And this is really what we are looking at here. Undergirding this, these verses and I think overriding them as well. So we want to look, even as we have great expectations with regard to God, God also has great expectations with regard to us. Don't you have expectations with respect to God? If not, you probably wouldn't get up in the morning and say, God, i got to face another day. Please be with me. There is an expectation. And after... The day is over and we're ready to retire. It's God, thanks for being with me. Be with me through the night. And on it goes. There is an expectation and there's at least a certain amount of fulfillment. And it should encourage us to know that God has great expectations for you and for me. Now one of the first responses can be, whoa, when God has expectations for me, are they going to be too great? Yes, they would be too great if it weren't for the sufficiency of his grace. But we also have expectations for God, with regard to God. And this is a part of our relationship. If we can insert hope in place of expectation, doesn't it do something for your thinking and mind to say, God has a hope in us? And I don't think that I am pushing the envelope theologically or biblically. And this is how we should live out our lives. God has great expectations for me. 
and they will be fulfilled. And I have expectations for him and they will be fulfilled. So let's get on with a little bit of joy even though in our lives there may not be much reason for it. And when we look at God's expectations for us, they're quite simple. He wants us to be a hopeful people. He wants us to be people of expectation. He wants us to see that the goal line is in fact attainable. And he wants us to be a holy people as well. When I grew up, to be holy was a very scary thing. And in many ways it still is. I don't care to minimize it in any way, but there's a sense of balance there. And we need to see that. So let's look at the hopeful people. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If there is ever a verse in all of God's word that speaks of expectation and hope, this is it. There are others, but this is really a great one. For if we were to take a look at the characteristics here in this verse, what we see is that hope is a necessary ingredient for our spiritual well-being. Take a look at the times when perhaps you become discouraged. I can speak for myself, and I know that often is the time when I get really discouraged. I'm looking too much at the moment and not enough at the long run. When I get the most despondent, it's when I'm looking at the situation as it is and divorcing it from the situation that will be in the power and the grace that undergirds where I am presently. And it is necessary for our spiritual well-being. And notice that it is final and that there is nothing more nor better when we are told to prepare our minds for action and to keep sober in spirit and to fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you. And what is the definition and the picture of that grace? The grand revelation of Jesus Christ when he appears in all of his splendor, when he appears in all of his majesty and his glory, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. Now that is a great expectation. And that is what should nourish us, strengthen us, and it should always be our focal point. For the object of our hope here is God's grace. It is by grace we have begun this Christian walk. It is by grace that we are sustained, and it is grace that will bring us home. And it is a new life in Christ as well. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. But a lot of times when we study prophecy and we read the books of prophecy, how many of them tell what's going to happen in the near future? Some of them predict and they fall to the ground in pieces. Hardly ever taking in mind that the scripture is clear. Nobody knows this time and this date. And you can take a look at all the charts you put together and what you have is your best guess and it's not good enough. And we need to keep our eyes on the end game. We need to keep our eyes on this particular promise and others with similar content, but according to his promise expectation. We are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That will be a real change, will it not? And so much more that attends to it. But this is the crown jewel. How many lives would be better in families if righteousness were king or queen? How many communities would be radically changed if there was a sense of righteousness? People call for justice, but there will never be justice apart from personal righteousness. And we are declared righteous in Jesus Christ, and we wait until that day when we will be as righteous as we are declared. And this is the end game. And notice that there are preconditions, there are logical preconditions to hope. It's like the foundation of the building. 
Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice this. It is a prepared mind. We live in a time when we are told that religion is all faith. And they make a break between faith and what they call fact. And there is hardly a system of knowledge that is not based somewhat on faith. And you can even find it stated in some of the philosophy books. They won't call it that. They will call it something like a little bit less than omniscient, so we'll call it fiduciant. We have faith that this is right. And what difference is that than for me to saying, I have faith that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, was suffering under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He ascended on the third, he, from the grave on the third day and he has ascended to the right hand of the Father and from there he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I don't know much difference. Not at the foundation line. But what I really like about this it's rather colorful in Greek. Here it is, prepare your minds for action. In Greek it is, gird up the loins of your mind. There is the picture of that Greco-Roman time when people would walk around with the long robes, but when it was time to run from the battle or run to the battle or to do something that caused some type of exertion of energy, you picked up those robes and you tied them around your waist and you were ready for action. And God's word says, be ready for action. And this is what we have to be as the people of God, ready for action. We don't sit here as though it is one of those high-class sitting rooms in an airport where if you paid big, big bucks, you can sit there and have yourself a bourbon or whatever it is until it's time for the plane to leave. Listen, friends, we're not even there. We are out girded for action. The mind is to be prepared and there is to be a fixed attitude. There is to be a clear focus. Keep sober in your spirit. Don't turn this into happy hoopla for Jesus. Turn it into some good, hard work for Jesus Christ and for his people and for those who will become his people. And have a focus. Fix your focus, your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Great expectation. Stay fixed firmly on Jesus Christ, who is the hope of glory. And keep your minds girded for action until he calls us to his own. This is God's expectation. And I could think of a lot worse ways to live my life than to live it hopefully with Jesus Christ as the object of my hope. Name any other object of hope and it will eventually fail one way or another. And let us remember who we are. And God's expectation does not come without sustaining grace. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If I had to live in a place where the Bible was banned and burned, and I could only keep just a fragment of scripture, this is the one right here. It tells me who I am in relationship to my brothers and sisters. It tells me who I am in relationship to God. It tells me how I got there by God's great mercy. And notice the privilege. 
You are a chosen race. This didn't happen by accident. This happened in the mind of our great God and Savior. That we share his traits. And we're reminded of that in 2 Peter chapter 1. For there are those attributes that can be shared, and he shares them. And notice the dignity. We are a royal priesthood. There is royalty flowing through our veins and in between us. But also the honor of a priesthood. To be able to represent God before, represent man before God. When someone comes to you and says, I have been praying for you, there is no greater honor than that. That person has exercised his or her priesthood on your behalf. And when prayed in the name of Jesus Christ, those prayers were heard. But it goes beyond that. We are also to represent those who are in the state of unbelief before the throne and to pray that God's grace would penetrate their lives and bring them out of a state of death into life and we pray for that. When I was growing up in Englewood, Colorado, the Southern Baptist Church just a few blocks away had this huge sign on the side. Everybody went by on Broadway could see it. Why pray when you can worry? And I used to ponder that all the time. You know, I, I was a literalist then, you know, and I couldn't understand these figures or any kind of sarcasm or anything like that. Why pray when you can worry? Because that's what we do best. We do that the best of all we worry. And one of my names at home was Donnie the Worrywart. I would start worrying the day before we jumped on the train to go see my grandma in Washington. We're going to miss the train. You're the day ahead. Well, think how bad it got on the day. And it's just so natural. You breathe, you worry. You worry, you breathe. It helps your heart beat. And it is so alien to pray. If I give it all over to God, what am I supposed to do? Oh, believe? And there is an honor and a dignity to being a part of that royal priesthood. And notice we are a nation among the nations. And many of us, and practically all of us, see that our country is going through troublesome times. And we worry. But we should pray, but we should never lose sight of the fact that we are a holy nation within a nation that needs holiness. And that where every brother or sister forms together and gathers together in the name of Jesus Christ, where he is there, that too is a church and they are a part of that holy nation within a nation that needs holiness. And this is our honor and our dignity. And in case Peter said you didn't pick up on it on that chosen race business, let me tell it to you again. We are a people of God's own possession. We belong to him and no one else. And that gets the brothers and sisters in trouble. The brothers and sisters in North Korea really catch it badly. Because when you have some kind of a dictator, they demand absolute fidelity and allegiance that only belongs to Jesus Christ. Yes, we're supposed to give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. We're supposed to subject ourselves to those who are in rule and authority over us. And we are supposed to be patriots but never at the expense of our heavenly citizenship. And notice, notice our privilege. We are a people of God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, the personal witness and testimony I was once in the darkness of unbelief and there I was chained as a prisoner. 
but through the proclamation of the gospel coming from a royal priest. The Spirit of God worked in my life and I was set free and I was transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His great light. And wherever that light is, there is life. And I did not deserve it. But God's grace was at work in terms of mercy. He saw my needy state and He saw my helpless state. And freely out of his own love with compassion, he moved me from the cell of darkness to the great kingdom of light. And it is my joy, my privilege, and my duty to tell you that this can happen to you as well. This is what it means to be a holy people in the practical sense of the term. And we can embrace that because certainly when we look at holy in relation to the person of God, that we are to be sinless in this type of thing. But we also need to see where the rubber meets the road. And this is who we must be individually as well. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. We are to be like the Holy One. One of the greatest privileges that could happen to you or to me, one of the greatest compliments that could ever happen to you or to me is for, one, for somebody to say, you're different than others. Why? Or you're just one of those Jesus freaks to use a term of days gone by. And even if it is said in a derisive tone, in the end, it is still a compliment. We are to be like our Lord and Savior. We are to be like God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not in the greatness of power. There's a lot of people going around claiming some great power. All I want to be is conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and be able to put one foot in front of the other day by day in a way that at the end of the journey, Jesus will say, well done, you good and faithful servant. He's called us for just such a life. Notice the conduct. The conduct of the mind and the conduct of the body. The conduct of the mind Gird up the loins of your mind and be ready for action. Get with it. There is where it begins and there is where it ends. And everything that happens through the hands and feet express what's going on in the heart and the soul. And this calls for a familial change. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. When you really did not know who Jesus was, when you really did not have a grip on God, this is how you would act. There is no God. So you be the law. And what will be the standard within your soul? your own lusts, your drives, and your desires. Those were the days of spiritual ignorance. But now, now that you live in the kingdom of light, be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. For notice the source. And notice how incompatible it is with the Christian walk. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But notice what worldliness is. When I grew up, there was a certain system of don'ts. If you didn't do those, you weren't worldly. And if you did them, you were worldly. And that was really kind of rough. Because I couldn't find some of them in the Bible or even come close to touching base. But here's what worldliness is. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Notice it is me-ism. It is me, first, foremost, and always. 
I am the king of the universe and you are here for my pleasure and my purpose. That which I see, I crave. That which I picture in my mind, I crave. And that which I attain, I proudly boast of my accomplishments. Never knowing that Jesus Christ in that great parable of the boastful one who filled his barns with grain and tore them down and put on bigger ones and said, look what I have accomplished. I will now sit back for the rest of my life and enjoy them. And what was said? You fool. This day your soul will be required of you. And what will happen to your goods? It is a new life of conformity. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. What a great family. That Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. Some churches where you go, they never ever call you Don or anything else. You're always brother so-and-so. Hello, brother so-and-so. Hello, sister so-and-so. And in some places, the first one who calls you brother is the one who's going to get you behind the head when you turn your back. But still in all, there is a biblical reality to that. That we are brothers and sisters in the family of God and Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews, and even here, is our elder brother. I find it interesting that when Jesus Christ comes, we bow our knee and we confess that he is king of kings and lord of lords, but somewhere I can whisper, he's my older brother. And notice it wasn't an accident. For those whom he foreknew in love, he also determined that they would be conformed to the image of his son. God has determined in spite of me that I will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to have many brothers and sisters along with me. What then? Let's go back to my favorite verse. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, so that others may know of a better life. Now and forever, we're still here. And we know why we're here. We're to proclaim the excellencies of that one who has called us by the greatness of his power out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so it seems that no matter where we are on the spectrum of fidelity, it never hurts to renew our dedication to being a holy people, a hopeful people, and in our holiness, we will proclaim the virtues of our Lord and Savior until he comes and our hope becomes a reality. And may that be the case for every one of us in this room. That when you go out the door today, you can say, Pastor, I have the hope and I'm trying as best I can to conform to the image of the one who has called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now there is a reason to live. And may God so grant that we are walking that path together. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the privilege and really the privileges for being a part of your family the privilege of having Jesus Christ as the older brother, the privilege of knowing that I have such a great hope, the privilege of speaking of what you have done by your grace in my life, just the privilege of representing Jesus Christ. Grant to us the greatness of grace that this privilege will never be forgotten, nor will it ever be disdained. In Christ's name we pray, amen.